Where do you even get a MIG that you can bring to Wyoming? Well, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I myself traveled to Poland and the USSR at the time in 1977. We did a, a music tour from Black Hill State University. And I recall while we were there in Warsaw, seeing these guys flying around over the city from a distance. Um, I knew they were MIGs. I didn't know much else about them. Uh, so I never dreamed that eventually one of these would be in my dad's hangar in Casper. Right. So it's a uh, trainer though, right? It, uh, these particular ones were used as a trainer. They're rather rare. Most MIGs are single seat, mm -hmm. single pilot. Uh, this particular airplane has a camera pod on the front. Mm -hmm. uh, it led my dad to believe that it was probably a surveillance aircraft. Right. The armament is also uh, lighter than on a typical MiG that was used for uh, pursuit and fighter aircraft. So how do you get it from there to here? He got hooked up with an importer. I'm sorry, I can't remember the guy's name now, but he was from Southern California and probably met him at the air races in Reno, would be my guess. Um, he let my dad know that you could secure MiGs from the cold pack from right. Warsaw. Um, the USSR was breaking apart at the time, and uh, actually Poland was buying uh, aircraft from the United States that were far superior to the MiG because, you know, quite a bit of time had transpired by the early 2000s. Um, so you could actually purchase one of these thirty dollars to $40,000 a piece. You could yeah. purchase a MiG almost for less than it cost to get them shipped to the United States. Um, Dad bought two along with a couple of partners and they put them in uh, shipping containers on a cargo ship. So shipper. wings off then. Took right. the wings off and the top section of the tail mm -hmm. came off and uh, they came with the gear up and they were sitting on a nice uh, uh, crib type arrangement inside the containers. Right. They had a big job when they got to Casper. They, they unloaded them in Houston at the port, put them on flatbed trucks and brought them here to Casper. Dad and, and a lot of his friends who uh, had aircraft maintenance expertise reassembled them here in this hangar. And uh, they had the silver one out running and taxiing right. around. Uh, so they're both uh, aircraft that could be made airworthy. Have either of them flown since they've been in the United States or just been on display? They have not flown since they've been here. I, I have some old video on uh, cassettes of the MiG sitting on the ramp in Warsaw running hmm. before they put them in the shipping containers. Right. So they were really ready to fly, apart from being disassembled, uh, when they got here. Okay. Um, could they both be made airworthy again? They could. It would, yeah. it would cost a lot of money. I'm sure. And the most expensive part of having a MiG-15 or a vintage aircraft like this is getting it certified. You have to fly a certain number of hours in it to get it certified. And we're talking about 300 gallons of fuel at five bucks a gallon, yeah. or whatever it is right now for for uh, Jet A fuel, and then uh, you're paying for a certified flight instructor to go along with you, and you you know everything that goes along with that. It's very expensive to get the aircraft certified even before you get checked out in it. Yeah, it doesn't even have to be registered as experimental at that point, or is it? They, uh, I believe they were registered as experimental. Yeah. Um, it was distressing for Dad after he got the aircraft here. We had 9/11, and uh, the federal government became very paranoid about any aircraft in the air that was uh, warbird right. capable. So there was a lot of red tape that he would have to go through to, to certify them and be checked out to fly in them. And that wasn't enough to dissuade him from doing it, but there was also uh, a move underfoot at the time with legislation to disallow flying them at all. And dad told me, he said, that was such a discouragement that I decided I'm just going to park them out here and let people enjoy them. Right. We're not going to fly them. When I've shown pictures of this before, right away, someone says, no, that's a Sabre. No, but there's a difference <laughs> between the Sabre and the right. MiG. So the difference in part you can tell right away is that tail. Correct. All right. Yeah, the horizontal stabilizer is up toward the top of the tail. Um, one of the disadvantages of that, not being what they call a flying tail, uh, was that this aircraft down below 33,000 feet was less maneuverable than our F-86 Sabre jet. Hmm. Um, we developed the Sabre jet specifically to counter this aircraft. Uh, when we first started our involvement in the Korean War, 
um, these guys were going up and knocking down our B-29s without a, without a great deal of difficulty. Um, what we had to counter them with at that time were P-38s and P-51 Mustang, yeah. piston-powered aircraft. So this was far superior and they had a big edge early in the war. Uh, once we put the F-86s up though, then they had their hands full. Right. So there's an advantage though to having it up higher and a disadvantage to having it up higher. So what's the advantage of up there? Well, the advantage I think was that up at altitude, this was a faster airplane. It has a service ceiling of 51,000 feet, which is higher than the F-86 can go by probably, I, I want to say 1,500 feet. Uh, so this airplane could come down onto our aircraft out of the sun, which puts you at a disadvantage. Yeah. And uh, up above 33,000 feet, the MiG-15 was faster than the F-86. So you had the height advantage and the speed advantage. However, if you could get a MiG on a horizontal plane below 33,000 feet, then the F-86 had an advantage. It was slightly faster than the MiG at lower altitudes and much more maneuverable. So it's a matter of how good is the pilot, does he know his airplane? It really was. Um, supposedly, the MiG-15s in Korea were being flown by North Korean pilots. And true in some cases they were, but oftentimes it was actually Russians flying the aircraft. And uh, of course, they came out of World War II with very experienced fighter pilots, and, and no one knew the MiG better than them because they built them yeah. in the USSR. So. It was an interesting contest between the two aircraft. Is this engine from this airplane? Actually, this is a spare engine. This okay. airplane already has a complete engine in it, Inside as does okay. the other one out on the ramp. Hmm. So uh, this is a spare. Uh, the Russians labeled it a RD-45. Uh, it has an interesting history in that uh, it's virtually a carbon copy of the English Rolls-Royce name engine. The Russians were allowed to visit England after the end of World War II, and uh, the English had a pro-Russian uh, foreign minister who, uh, much to the Russians' surprise, allowed them to have the specs and, mm. and engineering plans and everything they ne needed to replicate this engine. So really what you're looking at virtually is an English name Rolls-Royce engine, re-engineered by the Russians, but there's no difference. Um, right behind where you're standing, Glenn, this canvas, if you take it off, that's the, the jet intake for the engine. Um, it sits back in underneath the pilot in the fuselage, mm -hmm. and uh, the gases obviously are discharged out the back, back here. Um, eventually, the MiG-15 was modified slightly. It became a MiG-17. What they did was they added a, a longer section in the fuselage, and that airplane had an afterburner. So whereas this engine would take the MiG-15 up to 670 miles per hour, or Mach 0.95, almost the speed of sound. Mm -hmm. With an afterburner, they could exceed the speed of sound. Right. And then you started to have a really hot airplane that could go up against the, uh, the uh, Vietnam era uh, American fighters right. and actually equal them in, in many ways. Uh, but uh, essentially it's a Rolls-Royce English engine built up by the Russians for their use and uh, I, I'm sure if the if the English could have a do-over they probably wouldn't have done that. This one sits outside all year long. Is that a problem? Uh, it's not a problem. Uh, obviously we'd prefer to have both of them inside yeah. but um, that's a luxury we can't uh, we can't manage right now. Um, I would like to put some uh, covering in the canopy right. to keep the hot sun out of it this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, but but this, apart from that. This is the one that they tested down the runway and let the wheel come up, but they didn't lift off. No, they didn't because uh, uh, Bob nor my dad were checked out at it right. at the time. So all they could do is really a run up and a taxi and right. this type of thing. But if they wanted to get this thing going, it would cost uh, quite a bit of money, I guess. But they could. I mean, you said the engine's in, it just needs some right. work. Right, right. Um, you would have to go through the airplane and, you know, and, and uh, after sitting for so long, obviously you have to go through all the hydraulics and check right. the wiring and, and test everything. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a good solid airplane. The mm. Russians, when they built their airplanes, they built them for durability. Um, we were more of an emphasis, emphasis on technology and uh, 
they built an airplane that could take off from a grass strip right and could be repaired in the field which is one of the reasons that you see our guys going up the line walking the runway checking for anything that might be an obstruction right. and instead the russians have built air intakes that can close up for takeoff right. and then open up later right yeah so it can take a beating right um one of the disadvantages to the mig against our aircraft was that uh it had uh bigger guns on the airplane mm -hmm. but they had a slower firing rate right Whereas the F-86, if, as I was saying earlier, if they could get down on a level plane below 33,000 feet, um, they had the 50 caliber machine guns. And the advantage to this was that it was very hard to knock down with a 50 caliber. It would take a lot of punishment before you'd actually knock the airplane yeah. down. And my understanding was though, with a gun, if you got six 50 cal guns, that actually slows the airplane down. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, on the other hand, had uh, two 23 millimeter cannons and uh, one other larger cannon. Uh, the 23 millimeters, I think, would handle 40 rounds each, and the other one uh, also handled 40 rounds. Right. So they, you know, they had a limitation on how much right. shooting they could do up there, and, and the rate of fire was slower on this. And this is before the era when they were firing missiles at each other. They were still firing bullets to take each other down. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. The, there was no air-to-air -air missiles. Or uh, Another advantage that I forgot to mention was that um, the pilots that flew these, that flew both the MiG and the F-86, would tell you that we had superior gun sights. Hmm. So we did have some advantages. Also some advantages typically with pilot training right uh, and skill level but not necessarily so especially if there was a russian in the cockpit right um, our guys had their hands full this type of airplane has air brakes on the back i've noticed is that just for slowing down stopping yeah, or is it for maneuvering too they're speed brakes and okay to my knowledge they they would only be used for landing okay yeah because i could see deploying those and suddenly slowing down in yeah. the air or something like that yeah some of the later model migs have parachutes. There's a parachute for a MiG-29 hanging right. inside the hangar here. Hmm. Um, but these had speed brakes. Okay. Um, they're a heavy airplane. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a big old rock you mm -hmm. know, to fly. Uh, but put a big enough engine on it, yeah. you can certainly I get it off. The, it loaded with fuel and pilot and everything weighs around 11,300 pounds. Wow. And it's a 33 foot wingspan and not much longer than 33 feet. Yeah. So uh, it's just a big chunk of airplane. Mm. And uh, people that have flown them will tell you that they're they're pretty dicey to land. You have yeah. to stay on top of airspeed and right. and uh, it really takes some good seat of, the pi uh, seat of the pants pilot skills to fly one of these. For people who want to come out here and see these two airplanes, when's the museum open? Do they need any kind of permission? Well, it's convenient actually because with Soaring Aviation operating out of the hangar now, where we have our museum, uh, they're here generally every day of the week. And during business hours, they've been very good to let people come in. We have uh, LED lighting in the museum rooms. You can walk in, the lights come on automatically. There's a, a folder there that I created that describes all the things that you'll see in our museum, uh, in addition to your being able to walk around and check out the MIGs. So the guys are really good to let people come and do self-guided tours. Um, we were talking about doing, again, a video yeah. that will accommodate that uh, to make right. it a little more informative to people. So we want to be able to do self-guided tours, and then I will still do group tours. I do a lot of school groups, uh, people from the senior community. Hmm. Uh, COVID has slowed that down a little bit, but uh, you'd be amazed how many people have still come out this summer. Right. Uh, visiting the museum two, three people at a time is something they could still do and enjoy when everything else was closed down. So it's been a good thing.